Okay, it's going. Uh, oh, I try to connect it with the phone, but uh, it's a new camera for me, so sometimes uh, I don't know exactly how to go on that. Oh, it's, that's how it there looks There you go. Like. All right. Yeah. There's your monitor. Yeah, it's cool. Okay, so we go in. Uh, We have a special guest today, <laughs> Josh Barnett. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm always thinking what to start with. There is a lot of topics uh, uh, you are interesting in for me. And okay, I was thinking like that. Uh, in never surrender, in never back uh, down. Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, there is uh, one of the characters uh, says. Yo, old school, come on. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking, is there a kind of a, a fight between the generations in uh, MMA? Uh, because I felt like a younger guy said it to the older guy. Mm -hmm. And there is always kind of a, a fight between the generations. Does it go with the MMA too? I think it's just something that is inherent with life itself, especially with men, um, the younger generations are always looking to, they want to forge their own name. They want to do the things, well, at least they used to want to do the things in the world uh, where someone would build statues and monuments to their achievements, uh, put glory next to their name. Um, and, you know, I'd say in these days, maybe they do still, but maybe for different reasons, TikToks and and uh, how many likes they get on social media instead of, you know, whether or not they went and, I don't know, uh, formed the winged hussar armored cavalry or something of that nature. But uh, the young the young fighter generally feels like it's it's his opportunity, or at least he wants to make it so. So it's a really common theme. Okay. Uh, so is there anything that... Uh... Uh, bother you, I can say, like uh, that, uh, make you uh, a, a little bit mad, or maybe mad, it's not a uh, right word, but <laughs> you things don't that irritate like, me. Uh, irritates uh, off yeah, that sure. word uh, uh, in a younger generation. Yeah, well, they live ahistorically. Um, they act as if nothing that ever happened before them counts or has <laughs> anything to do with, uh, with where the future is going. But uh, the part of the problem with the future and maybe it's its course at the moment is that people aren't aware of history that they don't know where they came from and they're certainly not able to plot their path very very easily without an understanding of uh of of where one came from and to try and see where anybody that may have tried to move along a similar path and how they've failed before uh, human beings don't change, and they have never changed. From the first to the last that will ever be, will be the same human in thinking and feeling and emotions with all the same neuroses, uh, anxieties, strengths, weaknesses. People don't change. But uh, you know, technology changes. The environments may change, but the composition of a, of a normal human being, of a human being in general, is the same across uh, all time and all places, essentially. Uh, I I got you. I I could talk with this a little mm -hmm. bit. Could we uh, that maybe the human life is worth more than it was like I don't know hundreds or two hundreds years ago? Uh, uh, no, I wouldn't say so. I, I'd say that uh, we're we're maybe human life is less valuable now than it used to be. Um, we feel entire buildings full of people that do nothing but push papers around but we don't have people that build things produce things create in the same manner anymore you know even with uh, let's say AI art is now the big a big topic 
it still takes knowledge to understand what prompts to use and how to manipulate yes. the software, which to begin with is mostly going to be done by people with real skills and experience with using cameras and actual photography and film work and because they understand how the mechanisms operate. So therefore they can use those skills to manipulate the, the AI program to develop the art the way that they want it. But in time, people will only know what terms to use. They don't know what they really mean anymore. They won't really know how to use them in terms of their actual physical use with a camera. It'll be lost. And so when it comes back to it, people will be able to make AI art, but they will no longer be able to actually make photographs. Uh, you know what? Um, I heard uh, somebody said, like, there is no person in the world who knows how uh, uh, a smartphone uh, works. Uh, uh, there is a bunch of people who knows about this uh, part of this mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. this part of this. But, but not the uh, entirety uh, of the... Yeah, but uh, it's so complicated uh, thing that, uh, uh, yeah, that it's hard to know about uh, how uh, this complicated uh, um, thing, you know, mm -hmm. about this well, uh, phone. Uh, so... Uh, it's also hard right now to be a specialist in one thing with everything, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, but I feel like to make a good prompts uh, to the AI, mm -hmm. you still have to know yourself about this, uh, 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 about the photography, yes. whatever you are yes. in, you know. Uh, so. Uh, you just learn a new things, but I want to also say about um, this what you said about uh, the uh, younger generation. Mm -hmm. uh, it reminds me what you said about the words of one rapper. Mm, I uh, I do like rap music, and he said something like, uh, "Rap uh, younger generation don't." care about uh, the older generation at all, but the rock uh, generation, they do. Yes, they, that's they true. Do care. Metal music, heavy metal and rock music still plays real instruments, still knows how real instruments work, still writes their own music, and especially in bands, uh, in, in what you would say are like extreme metal, mm -hmm. most of them spend their whole lives becoming skilled enough to be able to play this music at a high level, mm -hmm. knowing that they're never going to be rich like a rapper could be. Um, <laughs> yet, yet rappers, I would say in this day and age, the new era is, you know, filled with people that can use much simpler uh, beat structures, mm -hmm. have somebody that might program everything on a computer it is it's just, but I don't blame the young generation necessarily because they don't know any better. They weren't raised in a system to have them look to the past or to, if a human being doesn't have to operate at a, at a certain level of competence, skill, um, if they don't have to put the hours in, if they don't have to reach a certain point, then mm -hmm. they won't. We'll do just enough to be able to be successful and no more most of the time. Now, there will always be exceptions, but generally we only go as high as we need to to keep our head above water. Okay, so uh, you say that uh, if everything is easier, we won't be trying uh, so much. Of course, if everything is easier, we will, be, we will drop to that level. Okay. The, the easier the world gets, the worse we get. <laughs> and that's a fact. Uh, okay, I, uh, I'm glad that you said that uh, there are uh, exceptions because uh, I, I, I feel like there are the people who, even uh, when they got a kind of a uh, easy life, they uh, they try hard and mm -hmm. they uh, do their best. Uh, so uh, it's not for everybody, but. Uh, in some levels, yeah, I would say yes. Uh, uh, people, they don't uh, respect skills no more, uh, uh, you know. Well, they, or they respect certain, what is considered a skill to respect is on a different level or different uh, gradation from where they used to be. You know, where what type of skills used to really bring 
respect and prominence are not the same that do so now. I think that the views are respected now uh, really, really much. The views? Yeah. yeah How many sure. subscribers you got? How right. many your last video had? Uh, yes. And, uh, uh, and uh, a lot of times yes. it's uh, more uh, respected thing than uh, you know, what you really do. But, you know, given enough... Uh, given enough um, push in a certain direction, if if it's uh, there's a, a philosopher Rene Girard who has this concept called uh, uh, mimetic. Uh, uh, well, I'm not going to forget it, of course. Uh, basically, what he's saying is is that if somebody sees this car driving down the street. Mm -hmm but he's never seen one before he doesn't does, you know it doesn't matter to him you know maybe it could aesthetically uh make it make some sort of impression on him but by and large it doesn't really matter but if there's advertising everywhere saying that this is the world's best car and everybody else he knows says this is the world's best car then he will be driven to also try to get this car because everybody and, uh, and the world the world and the environment around him all says that this is something worth competing for, essentially. And uh, with uh, mimetic desire, uh, you tilt the scales of human action. And so when you can make money and fame off of social media, mm -hmm. then you're going to start tilting the scales towards people valuing that over i don't know let's say you know being maybe even being a good father or being um a, a great mechanic or who knows what you know I, I would say maybe over being a great fighter but a fighter is somebody who works in entertainment as well so yes. it's kind of <laughs> difficult to say that those things can't apply to people that work in entertainment fighters included yeah <laughs> It uh, depends uh, of the um, uh, content you bring on and uh, mm -hmm. uh, how uh, hard you uh, work on this and how uh, yeah. you put the heart in this, you know, because well, uh, you can give a content which is, uh, uh, let's say, piece of shit and uh, you can uh, give a content which uh, well, is valuable. But, but then it's, it's very subjective. You could give piece of shit content that's very popular and people will go for it. Yes, but I think that in some certain situations uh, we can say it's a piece of shit. <laughs> because... I think so. Look, I think so. I think there's lots of things that we do today that are I would classify as piece of shit. I think most architecture is piece of shit. I think a lot of art, I think movies, I think a lot of music is all classified under piece of shit. I think most of uh, modern culture is piece of shit. But, uh, but, it, but even still, uh, beauty still lies out there. Excellence still exists. Um, and I don't look at the fact that exceptions are still the exceptions because it's always been about exceptions. Um, the exceptions always do rise to the to the top or create new stratas of culture or new stratas of of uh, of success in whatever they do. But exceptions okay. do run the world. Oh, of course. But uh, but the world is also made up of the person that shows up every single day and takes care of business. And that's a very important person. Okay. But that, that takes a certain type True. of will and uh, resilience. And, and maybe that's the lacking of that is, is maybe one of the most dangerous aspects of our, our, our current times. But uh, ultimately, um, I think, I, I think that there, even though we're, we've gotten to where we are now, the thing within us that is capable of, of being at a greater level still exists. It's still, it's still possible. But uh, the world, the technology uh, that inhabits everything about our daily lives, it, it's hard to, uh, to fight against that. And uh, kids, now it, there are generations of kids that have grown up and never known what it's like to not have an, an iPhone or a smartphone of some sort. True. They've never known to live without social media. And while 
knowing how to operate the things in the world around you is, of course, important. Everybody remembers when new technology came out and their parents had no idea how to use it. So you had to help them. Um, and it still will continue like that, I think, over time. It's, it, it just renews itself. But that sometimes they can help with the parents uh, with the new things True. they don't know about. Uh, True. And yeah. they are like, okay, mother, uh, <laughs> uh, hey, father, it's a easy thing. Come on, I will show you. I you had know? to be the guy to set the VCR to record things for the family. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> but uh, if, even, if even anybody watching this remembers what a VCR is. But... Uh, GCR? VCR, VCR. A video I, cassette recorder. Ah, okay. Yeah, I, tape. I, yeah of course. For, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, all my childhood, you know. Oh. I remember when I uh, got uh, from parents a uh, uh, double uh, VCR. Oh, you know? okay. Yeah, uh, you can record was, one side, play yes. one side and record the oh, other. Yeah. come on. I was doing the mixtapes, you know. <laughs> I was playing one uh, uh, song and I was putting uh, uh, on the other and just a part and switching to the other mm -hmm. and uh, and I mixed it on the Yeah, you had the cassette tape, you had the the video cassette, the music cassette, all of these things. But uh, but um, I, I think that as technology has increased, our ability to be healthy in the way we adopt it has been greatly diminished because technology moves much faster, I think, than people can really healthily i say healthily because as new apps come out and you've seen now though there are those apple headset goggle things that people put on and now they look at the world with virtual windows mm -hmm. in front of them and so this technology people will learn how to use it but it's not about being able to use it it's about being able to have these things integrated into your life where it doesn't or it doesn't create uh some kind of um detrimental effect on people you know social media has a lot of good potential things as a mode of communication and even as a mode of aesthetic presentation to the world that could be flourishing with all kinds of beneficial things but we are only people <laughs> and so we end up using it in the the, the cheapest fastest maybe sometimes the sleaziest way we can think of and it's, it's not that it can't be better, it's just that it's only going to be as good as we are. And sadly, we're just not that good. <laughs> oh, not, but you know what? Uh, I do like one thing about social media. What's that? Which people uh, always say it's bad. Mm. And I like kind of this hate in social media. The hate in social media? Yeah, I will tell you why. Mm. Because now we know more about ourselves. Uh, I remember when somebody told me a story about the old singer uh, who uh, was never into computer things. Mm -hmm. And he said that when the computers uh, came and internet and all of that, the management of the singer was never, uh, they never let him know to sit in the internet mm -hmm. because he could uh, hear truth about himself or maybe not even truth, sometimes lie about himself. Mm -hmm. But uh, when he was, um, uh, during back in the days when he was making the music, mm -hmm. he was always uh, he hearing uh, polite things. Oh, yo, you are great mm -hmm. from the woman. Hey, do you want to go to bed or dance with us or whatever the guys wanted? Do you want to drink mm -hmm. and stuff like that? And he never uh, heard uh, really bad things because people don't like to tell it in the face. Yes. And uh, now you can see what the people got really in mind. And all these uh, bad things, you can be uh, real with them. And I sometimes I like uh, more realness than the fakeness, even if this realness is uh, but do you painful. Think, you know? Do you think that people's critiques, though, are as real as their compliments? Because uh, most of the time I, I find that even the hate is as fake as the love because they do they say the hateful things because usually it's something within themselves that, that yes. is an issue but also they say it because it gets them more clicks more views more notices to be somebody that hates something and and we're wired so that negative things in the environment 
affect us and we pay attention to them more than mm -hmm. positive things. Because uh, if you're yes. living in, in nature, the thing that is dangerous is more, of needs course. to be concerned about more than the thing that is nice. You have to remember it uh, uh, more because uh, it's a way to survive, you right. know, uh, if you put your hand in a fire, you have to quickly remember yes. never put a uh, hand in a fire no more. Of course it is like that, but uh, the only point uh, what I meant is that uh, we now we know how fucked up thoughts people got in their <laughs> minds. <laughs> That's true. Um, and I'll say this, I think that there is a, a, a usefulness in whatever the commentary, uh, let's say, on your social media account is, I wouldn't say it, and I'll caveat this, it's not for everybody to read the comments. It's not good for everyone. Some, Most people, it's probably best post whatever you're going to do, create yes. your thing, move on. Uh -huh. But for those that are capable of and, and interested in really look, taking a view at not just who is in, engaged with what they make, uh, but also what threads run through the comments, good or bad. Uh -huh. Because it's not about whether or not what they say necessarily is true or false, but you are getting a glimpse at what, what reality they have created around you. What is the myth around you, the person that they want to exist in the world or that they believe in the world? Because you can, the true you can be presented in everything you do, but that doesn't mean everybody's going to be able to uh, interpret it as so. Yeah. Not to mention, there's people that don't want it to be that way. They want you to be some other thing that fills a particular niche in their life. And they will fight with all that they have for you to resemble that. And by reading the comments, be it good or bad, neutral, there's something that they're telling you about the way that they see you in the world, true or false. That's true. So that's why if um, you uh, got a, uh, you, you, you need to put a, a hard skin on yourself. Oh, yes. Uh, and uh, how you say in English like that, hard skin? Yeah, or, you got to be, you have thick skin, hard skin, thick yeah. skin. Yeah, depending on how much. Depending on what they're saying, maybe you need to put on a full suit of armor, you know, but either way. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I say sometimes I try not to uh, read uh, comments, I try to read statistics. Mm. So it means that uh, uh, a lot of people, uh, my mother told me back, back in the days when there was no social media, she said yeah. like uh, that. If one person uh, say, uh, you stupid, don't care about this. Mm -hmm. If a two persons uh, says, uh, it's not a problem. But if three persons say, try to think about this, what you're doing. So uh, if you got a lot of bad comments, uh, okay, there is uh, yeah. a lot of situations where a lot of people uh, don't know what's going on. But yeah, okay. Uh, well, and even if you tell, if you could put something in the world that is very true, and and very deep doesn't mean that the world is ready to receive it either ah it's true and it's not always time for this no uh, yeah. people who are successful they feel the time uh, like uh, sometimes uh, people who make a trends they are not successful mm -hmm. as the people who follow the trends they are successful you know it's true. also the uh, same thing with uh, uh, saying your opinion sometimes mm -hmm. uh, uh, opinion is too fresh for the times yes friedrich nietzsche was not popular in his no, day so not in Galileo his day galileo as well i'm just finishing the uh, uh, biography about the galileo okay uh, and yeah. uh, 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 he almost died uh, uh, because of uh, the truth he was saying, you know, and he said to say to the church that everything he discovered is not a truth because they would uh, torture him and he right. uses. Well, I think part of the, the thing that gets misconstrued about Galileo and the church is that it wasn't so much the church didn't believe that the earth was round or anything like that. The church did believe that the earth was round. You can see it in their coronations for kings. In other words, they usually hold a scepter mm -hmm. with a globe. 
with a round ball. They, they knew that the earth was round. It was, I would say it was more of a political measure. Yes, of course. So the, yeah. He was fucking up their uh, lifestyle, you know. He was saying to the other people, hey, these guys can be wrong with something. Oh, no, we are uh, right with everything. Right. How you can say something like that? Yeah, uh, as a threat to the authority of, of the church's word at the time. You know, things could be very, uh, very sticky back then. Oh, uh, boy. Well, yeah. nowadays, uh, uh, there's still a lot of uh, philosophies like that they got a uh, certain power. And uh, back in the days, they had a crazy power. Well, it, it things change, you know. Maybe the church doesn't have the power it used to, but all things uh, go through cycles of growth and rebirth, growth, death and rebirth. And, you know, no, nothing made of human hand in this world is is, is uh, immune to it. But uh, so even the church may lose power, but then Instagram gains it. You know, there is always going to be an aspect of, of power and authority. You, know, you look at uh, sometimes it's uh, maybe the news media. People will follow that and believe everything that they say. And a lot of that comes down to it's not that it's the news. It's not that it's the church. It's not that it's the the whatever the, the 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 thing may be people want surety in their life they want things to be narrowly defined and focused so that they can they can deal with the rest of the world knowing that okay does this information help me or hurt me <laughs> uh, it, 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 you know, it helps me so i can keep going yes fine doesn't matter if it's true or it's false for them it's just a matter of does this frame allow me to live in a way that makes me happy or not? And if it, if it does, they'll accept it. Although I will say, at least in matters of religious importance, generally you're dealing with you know, things of, the, of an existentialist nature and, and with the highest, um, the highest value and uh, stakes at the end of it, you know, if it's if it's a Christian concept or even any Abrahamic, you know, the idea of you can go to heaven or you go to hell. I mean, it's a pretty solid black and white concept. Although I guess for Catholics, you have purgatory. So if you, if you screw up, you can kind of work it off. But, <laughs> but, but you're still dealing with, you know, the potential of uh, burning in hell forever or living in, I don't know, uh, clouds and, and heaven, you know, whichever it may be. But um, so, yeah, maybe there's a bit more weight to all matters religious, but still uh, people are looking for things that help them have a have a frame to understand the world around them so that they can move and operate in a way that is sufficient for their happiness and their successfulness or, you know, at least lack of calamity. Yes, but sometimes it's uh, not even for those people. Uh, happiness is a status quo and it's a uh, uh, big uh, afraid and uh, being scary uh, of uh, change and change be, can be good a lot of times. Mm, yes, of course. And, uh, but uh, the unknown is the scariest thing of all. Death is an unknown and it frightens uh, the hell out of people. Um, and being with the crowd as we are social animals very social beings yeah. is in our benefit and in fact in much earlier times uh one very uh heavy punishment that could be levied on a person is to be banished to be sent away to be by themselves mm -hmm. to live on your own is generally to to go mad or to to die from out from not having enough help potentially so for us as humans we want to be a part of a group. We, we want our own circle of, of social and political and uh, you know, uh, bodies that, that help us out that we feel that we're a part of. Yeah, and that's what uh, also uh, built our power over the uh, other animals. Yes, everybody loves power. Power is the sexiest thing in the world. <laughs> when everybody goes on, if we want to talk about rappers, you know, most all they, the things that they sing, rap about the most are power money and women and things of status and nature that things that are of, of status and nature are status signaling power the power to attract the 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 really hot woman 
or women the power to garner all these funds and riches because nothing is nothing's hotter than power being a being a strong fighter is a great thing it's very powerful but if you have a lot of money you could just pay a lot of people to beat up anybody you needed ideally so you wouldn't even need to bother if you had the kind of power where you had the masses on your side then a singular person even if they were of physical or mental uh, strength far beyond your own capabilities it wouldn't matter you could use the dumbest and weakest of people but just enough of them and you'd still win true uh, if you if you are at this point uh, you was uh, uh, in a film uh, with Steven Seagal mm -hmm. who supports uh, Putin what yes, do does. you think about that I don't know what Steven Seagal is thinking in terms of I don't know what his end goal is for anything to be perfectly honest he doesn't ring as somebody with rational ambitions and like uh, what is what was the word I'm looking for like um, like future planning I think it's just I mean I I don't know him that well so I I don't know why he has taken this particular stance but I there you go you know just watch the video of him dancing so <laughs> I've seen you you mean uh, with Putin dancing? no no he was like doing some Georgian uh, I don't know he's just out there doing his press his, his pr public relations with uh, you know all the ex-soviet states I guess oh uh, okay um, uh, because I've seen a few videos uh, uh, with Putin, I don't remember, was he dancing or he was uh, doing some training? Probably I, I Aikido demonstration. Yeah, something like that. Uh, Putin is a, a judo player. So. Yes, yes, I know. But, uh, uh, you know, from our point of view, I mean, no, oh, okay, for me, he's uh, one of the biggest uh, mass murderers uh, in uh, our uh, times. So uh, I was really um, devastated when I've seen uh, uh, Sagal keep it. Well, I mean, him. even, I don't, I mean, when, when, when do we ever see uh, Poland liking Russia at all? I tell you, <laughs> I tell you, I tell you, I tell you. My uh, grandmother, uh -huh. she was uh, sent on Siberia mm -hmm. uh, during the war, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and it wasn't really Siberia, but it was uh, cold like uh, yes. this uh, to sure. Siberia. Well, there's uh, lots of places city. in Russia that uh, are cold like Siberia. It's uh, crazy. Uh, and uh, 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 and she said uh, to me one thing. Uh, you know, the Russian people sent us there, mm -hmm. but uh, I wouldn't survive if not the Russian people. Mm. And as the people, not the government and not the system, yes. uh, I like Russian people. So that's what I know from the home, uh, from my uh, home mm -hmm. about uh, the Russians. Yes. Uh, I never had uh, bad feelings uh, to the Russians as the people. I even do see like uh, we are, as Slavics, we are kind of similar yeah. in a lot of things. Uh, and uh, uh, I was drinking vodka with the Russians and we was uh, partying together and we had a good time. Yes. And we had a lot of common things. Yes. Uh, I, I just do hate the government and uh, uh, as well as the whole communistic systems which uh, for me uh, Putin is uh, a prolong of the system hmm. you know because he's from KGB and uh, that's this uh, yeah. kind of uh, now, the one thing uh, I could say oh, uh, well one yes people outside of governments we can we can have our we can have our um, the things that we like and dislike about different different cultures and different things. But ultimately, when people get to meeting each other, we see that we have more in common than we have different. And uh, I met a bunch of, uh, I was in Russia doing uh, some seminars and uh, as a special guest for a, a MMA promotion over there. And I met in Khabarovsk uh, Russian Air, Air, Air Force members mm -hmm. in, a, in a little small restaurant. 
and they could speak English, so they invited me to come to their table, and we had a wonderful time. They wanted to hear all about America, how much they love uh, American things, and wanted to know about what what Hollywood was like because I lived there at the time, mm-hmm. and uh, just all kinds of things that you would expect for anybody trying to meet with other people and learn about them. And their sentiment was the same. They don't hate the West. They don't have any problem with Americans as they're, 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 they were voicing to me. It's governments that have problems with each other. And I can agree with that. Governments make decisions. People just have to follow them um, in, in a sense. But when it comes to uh, <laughs> the, the feelings about the, the Russian governmental structures and things. And there's a long history with, with Poland and Russia, obviously, and I'm well aware of it. And uh, I can understand the, the animus that, that can still exist from even things as not that long ago as, uh, you know, the 40s. Uh, but yes, I will say that I don't think... Yes, because still the people who yeah, remember that. Of course. And I don't, but I don't think Putin wants to recreate any of the communist elements of Russia. I think there may be an inclination, maybe a want for uh, like a reunification of former lands, maybe like Bulgaria and maybe um, some of the more Russian centric uh, aspects of the Soviet Union. But Honestly, I think a lot of what he does is, is much like most modern politicians. It's, it's in terms of what gives, what gives or doesn't give a state power. And, yes. you know, if he thinks it's, 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 it, there's more power to run markets and you know, kind of uh, capitalist economies with, with global markets than it is to be communistic anymore. I um, tell you one thing, because... Uh, I do understand uh, the word communistic in a mm-hmm. different way than you do. Okay. Because uh, I do understand it uh, as a system and not, not really as uh, socialism or anything close to that. I understand it as um, a tyranny. As, oh, you mean authoritarian uh, top-down yeah, system. Yes, well, well, and uh, uh, that's my point because I was born in a communism mm-hmm. and uh, to really It, it wasn't anything like they say we are equal. No, no of course not. Uh, and it, it was <laughs> this the people on top yep. and this uh, uh, motherfuckers who uh, are down. Yep. And it was a crazy difference, you of know. Course. And uh, the point is, uh, they do not because people do talk. Is the Ukrainian was at the, this place? Does this uh, ground belong to these people or that people? And I say one thing: I don't give a shit about this. There's only one uh, point of view for me. People do live better on the West. If you got uh, 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 somebody who is not very well uh, qualified and he is looking uh, to, for the job on the west not on the east you know mm-hmm. uh, and but why because we don't have a communism since 30 years and we can go with a nice car like this you know mm-hmm. and i do remember when we was in the communism and there was this film from the states uh, it was a show wonderful years uh, oh, the wonder years yeah. yes man we was watching this and it was about the 60s in mm-hmm. the states And we was in the 80s, were on the uh, end of the 80s. Mm-hmm. And I was like, they do have everything we can dream of. And they do <laughs> have it 20 years ago. Yes. You know, they, the equipment which they got in a uh, house, mm-hmm. the stuff they got in the refrigerator mm-hmm. uh, and everything, they got it like 20 years, they had it better. Right. Why is like that? My parents and people around me, they work hard and they don't, uh, everything is a problem. A well, small there, there's are multiple a problem. reasons for that. Part of it is, one, the communist or an even potentially any socialist system that works from a top-down 
uh, redistribution, it just doesn't work because you can never accurately predict exactly what somebody's going to need. It also means that someone's going to sit back in the ministry and go, well, we don't need a better toaster, so let them have this one. It works good enough. And okay, but it, it's going to limit not only what can a person do for a living, it also limits their ability to purchase things and to see goods over time have competition and drive the market prices down. Markets are necessary because it tells you what people want. Now, you don't have to necessarily always yes. follow it, but it, it's way easier to let markets give you an idea where to put your money and investment, but it also lets people decide what it is that they want to buy. Now, of course, you can go back to my point about mimetic uh, desire and what will get built and why. I mean, that's a different argument, but it, it makes it so that you can have a greater options and things, more more food and, and food options. Uh, but the other thing about communism, or at least I'll say Soviet communism, yes. because I see that wherever you go, it's going to take its own flavor of whatever the group that, that is instituting it. So communism in North Korea is going to be a North Korean style communism, same as uh, you know Chinese communism is the way it's Which set up now. Which changed a lot. Oh, yeah, of course. And you got uh, socialism uh, uh, on Scandinavia countries, and uh, you know these countries, the uh, regular people live uh, pretty good if you look at the whole world. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's expensive as all hell to live there yes. because of it. But uh, if you think about it in an isolated case of uh, you know a social democracy like that, where you use high taxes yes. to create public public funding for different systems, um, you know, it has its pluses and minus. Everything has a plus and minus. But with Soviet communism, uh, it's just naked politics in that every system, democracies, republics, all the ones that you can think of, all end up with the people at the top making all the decisions mm -hmm. and the people at the bottom having to having to obey or deal with those decisions. But with Soviet communism, you've also had the issue of that one top-down redistribution model, which creates uh, scarcity of goods, like, like general necessities at times. Could be toilet paper, could be food, could be who knows what, right? But- uh, Come on, toilet paper was uh, uh, rare uh, as the communist. Uh, oh, that's too bad. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's yes, bad. man. Uh, uh, you could see uh, from the, uh, back in the days, you could see a picture like somebody is uh, uh, going from the shop happy as hell that he have a, a lot of, of toilet, uh, paper. toilet yeah. paper. You know, come on, what yeah. the fuck? But, uh, but the, um, the system, as far as the way Soviet communism was, it just, it was a stronger version of what already exists in terms of the people at the top are always the people. And you know, like general, some nobody from the ground doesn't get to rotate into the top of those ministries. It's always within the same groups, coming from the same schools, coming from the same backgrounds, with the same relationships. It's the same today, everywhere, especially in America. Especially so. in America, because, uh, you know, uh, um, of course, in Russia, you now got uh, a lot of people who uh, are uh, uh, running everything. Uh, yes. That's the people who are who was uh, with, for example, Putin uh, in his younger times. Yeah, uh, they all came uh, from the old Soviet ministries. They came uh, from, from KGB. the KGB to now yeah. NKBD or whatever. Uh, you know, yes. it's all, yeah. so it's kind of uh, we can say also the same school. Yeah. But uh, uh, environment uh, of these people is uh, much different than in the West. Yes. You know? uh, but yeah, that's it. Uh, only one thing I want to say that the point of the Soviet is they always manage the things uh, very badly. <laughs> and uh, uh, you yeah. know, they had in Ukraine uh, one of the craziest hungers uh, in yes, the, the world. Yes, the whole And Ukraine got the best grounds in the world, yes. you know, best grounds and they did shit like this. One of the greatest wheat producers in the world. And, you know, I love Ukrainian food. Uh, I've had it quite a, uh, I've Ukrainian borscht and kvass and uh, yeah. uh, it's, it's good stuff. But, yeah, uh, of course. but the reason why you can take some place that is so abundant in terms of its production of grain and mess it all up is because people, people make a decision 
And when they make this decision, it's and it and it turns out to be a bad decision, ill thought. But part of why they did that wasn't just because they wanted to take all the grain and redistribute it. It was a way of beating the Ukrainian people down so that they could not resist what the the you know the Politburo has was going to decide for them. If you really want to get a population to be much more pliable, start starving them. You know, of course, right off the bat, they're going to they're going to freak out. They're going to riot. They're going to try and burn things down. But if they don't have the ability to take the means of control back, then they're just going to have to suffer with it. And eventually, over time, they will break. So things like the Holodomor are not just logistics accidents. It is on purpose. And, you know, the the role of the, the, the Bolsheviks in terms of establishing their control was going to be at any means necessary. If they needed to murder millions of people to do it, they were going to do it. Because for them, as a communist, they believe that essentially a utopian system where all people would be equal and no government would be needed and everything would be taken care of and, and basically uh, um, provided for was just around the corner. It just was going to take one more bullet in some priest's head or, or, or some journalist or some, some teacher. It was going to take just one more country being taken over, one more person dying from taking all their grain, one more kulak eliminated. You know what they say about uh, uh, Stalin? Yeah. That the problem was that uh, like the Germans or the other countries, they had the enemies uh, uh, outside uh, of the country. So mm -hmm. they was fighting with the uh, other European countries or whatever. And uh, <laughs> Stalin mostly was killing his own people. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, that's the only, uh, also the fucked up problem of the system that uh, <laughs> it don't give a shit about uh, their own people. You know, because uh, for humanity, it's kind of a normal thing that we are in some groups, and uh, mm -hmm. some by the end of the day, we mm -hmm. say, okay, that's my family, and it's important, and that's yours family, and. Uh, it's not so important, right? And uh, but uh, here it was. That's my people. Fuck them, you know. Uh, well, I mean, ludzie u nas mnoga. You know what it means? Mm -mm. Uh, that's in the Russian. There is uh, people. It's a lot of them. <laughs> That's uh, yeah. uh, how they say. Ludzie well, u nas well, mnoga. You know, for for someone like Stalin inheriting the system from Lenin. Uh, and I guess I said NKVD earlier. I meant the F. What is it? FSD. That's uh, the new no, one. No, uh, FSD is now uh, for NKVD. Yeah. Uh, NK. Uh, that was WD. That was a long, long time ago. But Czerzynski uh, was uh, the founder of this. Who was a Polish guy? Oh, well, sure, sure. I can that's believe a, it. That's a uh, pretty interesting thing. The guy who started uh, uh, this. Uh, uh, Russian shit was a uh, Polish guy. Um, but uh, with Stalin inheriting the system from Lenin, for him it was a way, he was looking to, one, it seemingly re-mythologize Russia. So, you know, they are explicitly atheistic, being communists, but they created mythos around Mother Russia. And when you look at old Russian um, Soviet architecture and art it's very much imbued with mythology you know it, it, if you get rid of a church but you create a new one you're still religious yeah <laughs> but he he was re-establishing and, and, and looking to expand soviet communism because communism is an international doctrine it isn't one to sit at home and just take care of itself it's looking yeah. to be everywhere until the whole world is communist to a communist then there is a problem. Uh, truly, uh, as I read about this, they've been more even uh, uh, not about uh, really the country, they was more about working class. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the idea of them. Uh, well, that's and, the idea. Uh, uh, and they was like, uh, let's make, uh, uh, they've, they've been um, feeling like uh, they feel 
uh, the group for them that was the working class, not really the country. Mm -hmm. But uh, that that was also kind of a thinking well, uh, back in the days everywhere. But that know? was entirely throughout the turn of the 20th century. What was you know what's the uh, NSDP? What did that stand for? NSDP. Yeah. Mm. National Socialist. Deutsch, uh, an NSDAP, sorry, mm. National Socialist Deutsche Arbeitsparty, the uh, workers okay. again. Yeah. Then we know how that turned out. Mm -hmm. And then what were, what was the the growth? Where did the Italian fascists under Mussolini come from? They came from the syndicalists, mm -hmm. again from the working class concept. So all of these things stem from this idea that you know, this is all for the the sake of the working class and putting power back into the hands mm -hmm. of. Uh, those that produce uh, what they would consider like the, the meat and potatoes of, of a country. But ultimately, it just ends up with a bunch of people at the top anyways, who are not, <laughs> who are not of the working class. But, <laughs> By the end, of but, course. but you know, to, to give even the concepts, the idea, not, it's not NSTAP or anything like that, or communism, but to give the idea of the, the working class being given the power to be in charge of things, I think what we need to think about is who who do we look at and we think that's a person capable of being in charge of such such a uh, important and heavy responsibility role is it going to be a plumber is it going to be a, a professor is it gonna, i mean i don't think it can be just limited by profession but nonetheless i think that the person that can run a successful state is a, is a very unique type of person that we don't know where they're going to come from, but you know there's not going to be many of them. And so the idea that the workers can just do it is false. The, the idea that journalists or professors or academics can do it is also false. Now, intellectuals have a problem of sitting in their head and living in these bubbles where everything is about the theory that they think is going to happen. You know, communism, all these uh, types of of governmental uh, um, theories are just that they're theories you say well it'll end up this way if everybody is just properly educated it's like no it doesn't because everybody has their own wants their own needs their own personalities um, some people are psychopaths some people are very nice some people just want to be left alone how do you get it so every type of personality can have a place in a society and be healthy, raise families or don't or whatever it is that, that speaks to them and how they want to live their life. Be religious or don't be religious. That's a big divide therein. Um, but so these intellectuals will sit in their high towers thinking that they can construct the world from their models in their heads, but they've never actually lived on the ground where then you've got the working class and let's say, and we're talking about the working class when we talk about communism and all these other uh, working class derived systems. The working class then were machinists and painters, like, you know, house painters and things like that. People that bakers and uh, uh, maybe oil drillers and you know, people that worked in labor jobs, not, not at subway taking money and handing you a sandwich hmm. or someone that uh, sells you a cell phone uh you know out of a cell phone shop that's not the same thing they don't those are service jobs those are not like really the same as what people were talking about the working class in those days but those people they live absolutely on the ground however being on the ground means you can't see from above and get the big picture so it's really it's just to think that the workers or the academics, it's just a really difficult thing to find anybody who is made of the right sort of stuff to be able to hold all the responsibility and the weight of having an entire state, an entire country of people on their back to try and make sure that these things work out well enough that your country succeeds. And from the smallest person to the most powerful person, that they can be happy in their way. Hmm. That's a lot to think about. Yeah.
And uh, you know, there are some books like uh, uh, what makes people geniuses or what makes yeah. people uh, leaders. But I think by the end, it's really hard to uh, find out the only one way that somebody should be born like that or yeah. be like that. And uh, oh, come on, uh, it's uh, so much complicated. Um, uh, you you got uh, a lot of communist uh, people who created the communism uh, wasn't. Uh, from the working uh, class, right? Uh, of course, and the entirety of the Bolshevik upper upper level was all academics. They weren't working class. Almost none of them were working class. And Buddha, uh, he wasn't a guy from the working class, and he was an uh, idea and philosopher for uh, yes. millions of people. Correct. And uh, he was a guy who was uh, born as a prince, as I remember. Right. Uh, he was royalty. Yeah. But yet he brought himself yeah. down to a to the to lowest see what's level. Going on. And then to <laughs> go start from the bottom and blossom all the way to what he saw as. Uh, you know his highest highest way of, of being in the world but I think you take someone like Buddha right and well that person was always capable and likely would be that kind of person no matter what station they started in uh -huh. they're the exception now, uh, as the history knows about this uh, person uh, uh, that was somebody really special, and uh, is any of this uh, of the philosophies maybe even a spiritual close to you? Uh, what do you think about uh, uh, all these things? Okay, what's going on when we die? You <laughs> thinking about this? I like to uh, talk with the people I, about that. I don't. I don't really think about what happens when we die because there's at least two two paths I can think of. Uh, to, to narrow it down and simplify it. Either A, there is some sort of afterlife, mm -hmm. uh, or, um, or let's say, make it three. There is either an afterlife, there is a concept of reincarnation. So either way, you're dealing with what we would call the supernatural. Uh -huh. Or B, in a totally material, materialistic way, there's nothing. It is, it is absolutely the end of you and anything that, that is about you, your consciousness, your spirit, your thoughts, your chemical processes, all of it is nil, gone. Now, in either case, if there is an afterlife, I don't think that we're capable of accurately knowing what that really is. I think that whatever that may be is beyond our ability to comprehend. Uh, if there is some sort of reincarnation, okay, um, that's also quite complicated if you really think about it and would it's crazy complicated it, yes but in the last example if there is literally nothing it's scary to think about but when it when it comes it won't matter because there will be no more fear there will be no more love there will be no more anything your to imagine ourselves as being nothing is fairly fairly hard to do and i understand the fear that can come from such an idea, but ultimately, we I, had really bad. Uh, I had this flight I had to take recently with my fiance just a week ago, uh, three days ago, and the turbulence was really bad coming out of Denver. I mean, this plane is dropping, it's going crazy. Mm -hmm. And my fiance, you know, she's grabbing onto me and mm -hmm. holding on. I can tell she's getting real nervous, and other people, you can see the tension. But she could feel that my heart rate didn't even go up okay. because you know, I, I kissed her on her head and held her and you know, was there for her. But, ult but when we got off that plane, I said to her, the only thing that went through my mind is, well, I don't want to die in a stupid, shitty plane wreck. Uh, <laughs> I have a lot more to do in the world. I have a lot more that I want to express. I want to see, to learn people that I, I want to be with and, and, and things I want to create. But if I die today, at least I can die with the person I love and that's it. I'm fine. I don't care. Okay. You know, I, I don't want to die, but I'm not afraid. And you know, if we fall out of the sky, we fall out of the sky. I'll do it with her. Hmm. Ah, it's a very big, str uh, strange, uh, 
strange, uh, like like approach. Strong, uh, yeah. Approach. Uh, a power. It's a big yeah. power not to be afraid of that. Uh, I cannot say I'm a fucking afraid. I hate fucking <laughs> uh, planes. <laughs> I cannot understand uh, how this shit is flying. I know? get it. It's, it's uh, you know, it is actually pretty amazing to think about what we can do with technology and, and the way airplanes have, uh, have have kept evolving over time. Although I do, I'm starting to worry that maybe our days of high technological innovation, I, I'm, a, I'm a bit worried that just like it's almost impossible for us to get to the moon like we used to. Um, we want to go to Mars. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how we're going to make that happen. And I'm, you know, we used to have things like the, uh, the, the Concorde uh -huh. yeah. jet flying yeah. between London and New York. Yes. Now we don't have, we, I don't even think we can make that again. I think we can, but uh, it was... Uh, uh, crazy in uh, a lot of points uh, because uh, as there was a, a big uh, fuel, uh, fuel, uh, yeah. fuel uh, uh, taking uh, and uh, uh, yeah I've seen some documents uh, about this how they uh, stay at some uh, plane cemetery mm -hmm. uh, oh they conquered that's a in interesting case I want I want that Again, I want to. I want the Concorde to exist, you know. In my world, that means we're doing we're doing something right, you know. We're moving forward, but uh, I, you know, it's just it's it's not wanting to die or thinking like, oh, that's fine. I'd rather not if I could help it, but uh, I know that eventually I will, and it is unavoidable. And so, therefore, I think life is much easier to go through it when you you accept death and you hold its hand uh, you know what I all uh, also when I think about the death about the uh, this kind of stuff I uh, do think about something else than uh, is this a heaven or whatever it mm -hmm. is but I do think about kind of um, uh, most of the religious are um, like uh, in a process of thinking that we will be judged yes. and uh, we will be judged are we good and then in this point starts what is really good because mm -hmm. it's uh, for uh, uh, intelligent person it's easy to manipulate this uh, uh, and uh, in yeah, we can make all these arguments we can yeah. try to rationalize all kinds of uh, bad behaviors and and bad decisions and selfish actions and I think that as well, I say that we, it, we can't really know what a potential afterlife would be like I think we couldn't really even know what that if there was a judgment what that judgment would be because we try to think about it from the the, the perspective of being a human on this world we wouldn't be judged by ourselves we would be judged by something beyond us. Uh, to be honest, I think we will be judged by ourselves. Hmm. I, uh, that's what I do think. Well, okay, I, that I, would I tell be you why. Fair enough. Uh, I tell you why. Uh, the, uh, what I wanted to say, I like more than thinking about being judged, uh, is uh, I like uh, the idea of uh, discovering uh, the world and uh, everything and I there's I, I didn't uh, came with this uh, philosophy but there is a philosophy that uh, there is a, a God is called like um, the beginning and uh, mm -hmm. uh, that we are just a little hands sent by this God to uh, participate and discover everything mm. what can, can be discovered and we are just uh, one of this uh, thousands of fingers uh, millions billions of them and we just come to the beginning and we are just an information uh, and I like this concept uh, better mm. but I was uh, talking with one guy who uh, lived his uh, death and uh, uh, he came back he was all uh, how you call this uh, kind of death in English? Oh, uh, he died, but uh, he died maybe um, 
and and uh, he came back to life. He yeah, yeah. There is a certain name for that. That, but um, anyway, um, and what he said, uh, I started a, a conversation with him. Uh, I had an idea for that, and I started uh, about asking uh, him about his childhood, mm -hmm. and uh, he said me how he was. Uh, um, what he learned and in a childhood, what religion he had, and mm -hmm. all of that, and this uh, during this death he had uh, all the feelings, uh, considering uh, the um, way of thinking he be became to have during his whole life, mm -hmm. and so I'm asking if you are, let's say. A cannibal, or and you learned that it's good to eat uh, the uh, people from mm -hmm. the other uh, village or right. whatever. And uh, you was always uh, feeling that oh, we had a good day today. We attacked them and we mm -hmm. won. That's a simple thing. You yes. don't have on your uh, uh, in yourself a bad feeling about right. what you your did. Your conscience isn't bothered. Yes, your conscience is clear yeah. because you was doing good with your conscience so why you uh, you supposed to be judged by the end that uh, hey you was doing bad man <laughs> uh, and uh, maybe the other way uh, you are doing all the good things you're helping to the people but that wasn't the point the point was to be a funny guy and hey you wasn't funny at all you was a boring <laughs> motherfucker well that's uh, that's like uh... so uh, that's why I said, by the end, yeah. I think we judge ourselves because we uh, can feel bad about something we really felt uh, bad with. Well, that would be like Heidegger's concept of Dasein, um, which would be saying that by being the best, most you that you were ever could have been, so living up into your fullest potential of who you were and who you could have been uh, would be the the highest would be would be the way to be judged at your highest so if you were a cannibal born in Papua New Guinea maybe yes. or somewhere and you raided many villages and ate many hearts and I don't know what then you were the best and you would be judged as great because you were yes. great at who you were yes and I guess in terms of thinking about a judgment in afterlifes, it brings up those kind of discussions. Well, if you were a, if you were a mentally ill person, how could you be judged by your actions if you were never really fully, totally in control of them? Or if you were a psychopath and you were a mass and you were a serial killer, if you were really good at it and never got caught, would you be judged as, uh, as as to the highest? of your of your life in this world i mean it's it does bring up a lot of different discussions because you know whoever considered writing these things down in these books has a concept around the general about the general person and it'll work and it'll it'll overlay onto people in in, a, in such a fashion that they'll be under able to understand it and it'll make sense to them but those on the fringes on the outsides and if you give it more more introspection of course the arguments can find you can find holes you can find places where they don't hold water where they leak but i don't think most people can't really live in a way with too much subtlety and gray they need more black and white yeah because uh most people want to uh to be told what to do that's true. I choose different. Uh, you have a water over here, or you have a drink over here if you would like to drink. Uh, uh, oh, is it? A, it's a boar. Uh, it's a Polish drink called the Jik. Jik. It's a wild pig. A wild uh, pig. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, zero calories and zero caffeine. So yeah. what's in it then? Is it, <laughs> it's not water. It's just flavored. It's flavored, flavored. Water? it's flavored. All right. Yeah. Does it taste like uh, Jiku? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I didn't lick any Jiku. <laughs> I, I hope it gives me tusks. Oh. I like that uh, beer 
is cheaper than water here. Okay. <laughs> or as cheap at times. Okay. We're back. Uh, About this. Mm, nah, it, uh, it's not a problem. It's only that uh, it's not uh, uh, connected. Okay. But uh, here you see that so, uh, everything is going. American cars, not as good as European cars. Yeah. Depends. Now, in when it comes to like older American cars, especially ones uh, like muscle cars and things like that, better than almost every European car in every mm -hmm. way. Back then, European cars were small, weak, little like things that just kind of get you around. Of course, there was a few that were decently made for sure and strong, but uh, when it came to high performance cars, there was you know, basically very few at the top. Whereas America had whole genera whole companies making bunch of muscle cars and fast cars and all this. And, you know, to compare, say, when America went all in on vehicle development and racing, they made the GT40 and it beat Ferrari mm -hmm. and it beat Mercedes and everybody. It beat all of them. Um, but then that program was not renewed after the fact. But European cars, of course, weren't built with the roads that America had in mind. European cars were built with European roads, which could vary greatly. They could be really tiny and small, like mm -hmm. you find all those small Italian vehicles, mm -hmm. or they would be bigger or larger, who knows? Over time now with, uh, you know, I like, I think German cars have been really well done, you know, with Mercedes and BMW and- They uh, are. Porsche, uh, very and great cars. All of that. You know, Porsche is a, and is example of like just a, a great car maker. Period. But America has had a lot of ups and downs in its vehicle design. Uh, in the '70s, we had a, a bunch of really terrible cars. Early '80s, some of the worst vehicles you'll ever come across. But it's not because America couldn't make good cars. They just, uh, it's a lot of factors. But just really awful and these days we still make some decent vehicles but there's often so many different vehicles in all these lineups that they can be very different in terms of their quality across the board and the thing is if you really want a nice car generally um, you're gonna have to spend a little bit of money on it and you know things are expensive these days so it's difficult to do that sometimes true and uh, you can get by with more plastic and and things inside the interiors. But when I say a really nice car, I mean something that has better fitted materials, has more soundproofing, is more comfortable, um, has better braking, because braking is very important. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, it's just gonna take a little bit of money. Uh, I tell you what, uh, what, what do I think? I, uh, when I think about, uh, uh, American cars, mm -hmm. I think about uh, Mustang, yes. Dodge, mm -hmm. Cadillac. Mm -hmm. uh, funny, I don't think too much about the Ford, but maybe a little bit about the uh, Mustangs uh, at least, yeah. Uh, ah, must, okay. Uh, but I do think about the muscle cars, which are beautiful. Mm -hmm. When I look how they are designed, I, I think, oh, it look hard, arrogant in the way I do like. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. But uh, today we got a borrowed card. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I got it uh, from uh, Xelindershi.pl. That's uh, uh, a firm which borrows a nice this, car. This would be a great car for driving every day in a, in a big city like this because it's a hybrid. It gets good gas mileage. It's very comfortable. It's quiet, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and but I, what, what I wanted to say is that I drove uh, a lot of cars and also American ones, mm -hmm. and uh, always when I drive them, I feel like okay, I see that people will see me, and I uh, feel maybe even stronger than uh, than I am. But uh, it when you put uh, the pedal, uh, you. Uh, 
it can you know uh, goes like that yeah. uh, uh, you really have to know how to drive this car it uh, when you uh, turn uh, then it doesn't you know goes like a regular Porsche or BMW no. and it's much harder uh, to drive you know yes we were gonna have that's to because change of battery uh, anyway. Sorry, because <laughs> you put it. it the old one. Uh, uh, well, no, it's my uh, fault because I didn't tell you uh, which one to put. And I had one conversation and just a moment. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's talk. If uh, Well, the thing is, uh, a Mustang is substantially cheaper than its competitor in BMW. And that uh, what you what you're not paying for is some is that gap in in price that allows you to customize that car and adjust it however you like it. Uh, you know, when the Mustang, let's see what they call it, the um, the S197 platform came out. That was in 2005, mm -hmm. and they went from they were talking about maybe doing independent rear suspension like they were doing on the 2000 to 2004 Cobra Mustangs. And everybody was very excited about that. But then when the Mustang came out in 05, that 197 platform, they had a three link rear end. And everybody was like, oh, this is a step back. Why did they do that? <laughs> Yet in the class racing against the BMWs, Porsche, mm -hmm. everybody, the Mustang kicked the shit out of them okay. every single time. And the Mustang is still one of the fastest uh, road racing vehicles in its class against BMW M3s, against the Mercedes, -S the AMG cars, against Porsches. And it does it just fine, if not wins, most all the time. And the plastics inside. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Let's not compare. <laughs> when it comes to that, there is no comparison. A BMW M3 has a way nicer cabin than a than a Mustang usually. Yes, all the, the plastic stuff. If that's if if there's one thing where you could really complain about those muscle cars, uh, even the modern ones, is the interiors are eh, you know depending. Um, I have a GT500 uh, 2008. Plastic on the door handles, plastic in the you know it's it's whatever. But uh, I except the fact <laughs> that it is very American to be sort of like, well, we have a huge engine, we've got big brakes. Well, just throw stuff around it and just get it on the road. Nobody cares. Oh, you know? I, I got a big dick. I don't need a brain. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But uh, I, I like the fact that um, that those cars do take a lot of skill to drive, but that's Part of that's just because of high horsepower and rear wheel drive. But they've gotten better over the years with more electronic traction control and things like that. But um, if you have better, better, better control dynamics in your, in your, uh, in the programming, in your suspension and in your, your, your tuning, it's just, it's, it's easier to, to be able to apply power, let alone if you're driving a an all-wheel drive vehicle, it's almost like cheating. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I, cause uh, I've driven a lot of cars on the track, and uh, I like driving my GT500. It makes 700 horsepower to the rear wheels, and it's dangerous. You know, I can't just let anybody drive it. They'll kill themselves. And it tries to kill me sometimes, but it's fun. It's got a personality, you know what I mean? Yeah, some people call it soul, <laughs> uh, but... Uh, uh, I'm uh, by the end. Uh, I'm kind of um, fan of uh, uh, of German cars. Yeah. Um, I do like, for example, very much Range Rovers, which are a kind of a English kind oh, of yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Indian. But uh, I had a Range Rover, and some small certain things was uh, spoiling yes. so fast. Yes. Uh, like. Uh, so stupid little yeah, things. You that's know? that's the uh, knock on Range Rovers that they have all kinds of little stupid problems all yes. the time. And I'll I tell you what I drive every day. Yeah. So I have my GT500. I have a 1975 
uh, Pontiac Firebird formula okay. with a 7.6 liter engine. Mm -hmm. And it's, I love it. Okay. That's my favorite. But what do I drive every day? Uh, 2013 GLK Mercedes diesel. Okay. Comfortable. Uh, the diesel gets great gas mileage. I can, it, it's, it's as comfortable and as easy to drive as possible. <laughs> and when you got to sit in traffic for hours sometimes, uh -huh. it's a lot easier to do it in that. When I used to drive my, I had an 09 SRT8 Dodge Challenger, six speed car. And driving that in traffic would just get so old, so quick, <laughs> so old. Just constantly shifting and shifting and shifting and shifting and sh but going nowhere, you know. I'm not going into a corner and I'm down shifting and heel towing it. No, I'm just doing this on a freeway. You Sucks. could you could buy a bike. Yeah. <laughs> okay. One little. Okay. We All right. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, so there's a Mustang right there. Uh, yeah, six cylinder though. It is, it is. V6. Cadillacs are beautiful, but uh, uh, I don't know really what this uh, uh, cars are for. I, I could. Uh, They're luxury car. I could have a, a bath in a car like this. <laughs> <laughs> I would make a pool I'll out, say out of uh, <laughs> one of them. <laughs> um, when, oh, there's a diesel right there. See, I like diesel cars. I like great, it too. great, great mileage, uh, lots of uh, torque, great for towing. But uh, I'll, here's something. So you'll see the wrappers all the time, buying Bentleys, Rolls Royce, all this stuff, right? Yeah. Here's the thing. If you drive a Rolls Royce or a Bentley, and it's not one of the two-door GTs, mm -hmm. then you're, you're a loser. Because if you drive it, does that mean, okay, you spend all this money on this big fancy luxury car, that car is not to be, you're not to drive that car. You're to be driven in a car like that. So if you're a real big shot, you have a driver. Ooh. And that driver takes you everywhere you want to go. And you sit in the back because the back has been extended. It has all this extra space. It's got a little refrigerator. It's got everything you could think of. Yeah. Sitting up here, that's work. <laughs> Why the fuck do I want to buy the most okay. expensive, beautiful manicured luxury vehicles <laughs> to be driven in in the world so that I could sit here and be my own fucking driver. That's, that is the lamest fucking loser material. Oh, I blew all this money on this thing so that I can keep working instead of having somebody drive you everywhere you need to go. Those cars are gorgeous, especially the older ones. You know, you look in the back, the amount of detail, it, it goes into fitting, hand fitting, all of that stuff and building out these things. You know, seeing all those guys, the rappers with the Maybox, you're like, why? I don't want to fucking drive. If I'm this rich, I want to be driven. If I want to drive, give me something worth driving. Some of them are driven as mm -hmm. well. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's true. But uh, there is the smaller uh, Rolls Royce. It's uh, to drive on and this bigger. It's a two door it's, car, though. Uh, a Rolls Royce, I, I don't know. They got like, I, I think, three models or maybe, I don't know. Well, it's like uh, the was... Bentley came out with the uh, the Bentley GT, mm -hmm. which was a two-door Bentley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a GT car. It's made yes. for touring. And, of course, Rolls Royce goes, well, we got to make one too. Mm -hmm. So each of them offer yeah. one, right? Yeah. But you know, when I see like the Lamborghini SUV, I go, what's the point of that? Mm -hmm. Like I, if, I, if I want a Lamborghini, I don't need a super fast SUV. Give me a Lamborghini. The only problem is driving it on the street would, would make my blood pressure go way too high mm -hmm. because it's so low. Like getting in and out of uh, curbs and going up into driveways and uh, scra scraping it up and damaging all the little all the little arrow pieces on the ground. Uh, you know uh, what? Uh, it's a problem that a lot of uh, things uh, the, are not used uh, as they supposed to be used. Yes, and uh, uh, it's a. Um, I think it's uh, also uh, the big problem of the people when when the people don't do the things they've been born to. Mm. Uh, but not everybody got a luxury like this, True. you know. And with the cars, it's like everybody got to uh, have this uh, uh, SUV uh, car. Mm. 
If I want a Lamborghini, probably I want a racing car. If I want a SUV car or a terrain car, mm -hmm. I would like to have a Range Rover mm -hmm. because they've been doing this since like a hundred years or something like that. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe they know something more about this thing. I don't know, but... Uh, but well, yeah, if you want a race car, buy it from people that make race cars. If yes. you want a car that's for uh, traveling off-road, buy it from somebody that that's what they specialize in. Yes, yeah, sure. but the, that's the point that the customers uh, says, say to the people uh, what to do. And uh, people buy like a uh, G-Class, for example, which is a great terrain car. Uh, oh, the G-Wagons, yeah. Yeah, G-Wagons. Beautiful uh, terrain car. Mm -hmm. And uh, and what? And nobody goes... Uh, Off-roading. In, in Off-roading. <laughs> uh, terrain, uh, ah, but because I said it like in Porsche, we yes. say terrain of it, terrain. Okay. Uh, uh, Off-road car. Yeah. yeah. Great off-road car. And, uh, but... Almost nobody goes off-road with a, a G-Wagon. Right. And uh, so they want the big rims and all of that is made like... And I'm asking, what this ridiculous, ridiculous car is for at this moment? Just to... It's a symbol. It's a status symbol yeah, to show course, that I'm a, of course. I'm a person of power and means. Uh, look at me. Uh, I am unique and special. Uh, and what I've done with my vehicle. And maybe sometimes people just like it. It makes them feel good to have it. And of course, you know, there is that. But uh, if I've ridden in G Wagons before, they're kind of loud. So mm -hmm. when I think about something that would be driven every day in the in, in a city, I think Porsche makes a better SUV for that and Mercedes and BMW. If you even want one that's that's fast, uh, I know like BMW has the M5, that thing is fast as all hell. And all the the AMGs and uh, the Porsche, what is it, the Cayenne GTs and GTSs, those are all damn fast. Audi Q8 uh, yeah. is a, a great car and it really drives very well. Uh, as well as uh, X7 from BMW, I was surprised. Oh, that's a, that's it's a such one, a yeah. big car. I don't like it from outside. Yeah. When I look at this, it looks like a caravan. <laughs> and uh, but uh, it, when you drive it, I was surprised. I was like, oh fuck, how it goes, you know? You know, a part of me would want like the an AMG Mercedes SUV because I I love the application of power in those those vehicles they're really well made same with uh like the x5 or the x6m those are all x5m those are all incredibly fast cars but i have fast cars so i always tell myself don't That's spend enough. it on an suv <laughs> get the diesel <laughs> get the more uh get the get the vehicle that is is more utilitarian because all my other cars they just suck gas like nobody's business. Um. Hey, I got a question for the car lovers. Um, mm -hmm. And always the same. If you could get free cars for free, but there is only one point. Okay. You have to use them uh, mm -hmm. because you can say, okay, so the most expensive, and yeah, I, I yeah, will yeah. sell it or whatever. But, but you but, have to drive them. You have to drive them. Free cars. You, uh, somebody says, I'll buy free cars, but you got to use them. Mm -hmm. What would it be? Oh, that's a really hard question. Whatever. Three whatever cars. in a world, uh, but to use them. Uh, I would say, do they have to be new cars? Whatever you want, whatever, free cars, uh, but you got to use them, not to sell them, not put them in a, I don't know, garage yes. or whatever, okay. just use them. Okay, uh, uh, I would say, well, uh, I, would, I would say a 1967, GT500, night mist blue with uh, white stripes, uh, a a 
we'll, we'll, we'll put something utilitarian in there. So let's say uh, uh, an X5M. Okay. Let's say we'll go with a 20... A 2023, that's fine. We'll go the newest one. So there's my daily driving vehicle. And then uh, the latest iteration of an M1 Abrams tank. I'll take that. Uh, please remember, uh, please uh, repeat this last one. The latest version of the M1 Abrams battle tank. Oh, fuck. I don't even know what it is. A tank? Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I got it. Okay, we can... Uh... Manage this is a car, you know. <laughs> where, where would you drive with that? <laughs> Any fucking where I please. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay, so we got it. Uh, we come in uh, to the end, so of course you have a uh, uh, this weekend uh, mm -hmm. uh, fight. Uh, let's uh, uh, have a little conversation by the end about this uh, fight. What do you think about the uh, formula of uh, this? I mean that uh, you got this grappling grappling it's match, grappling, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah. Wouldn't you like to smash somebody? Uh, I like smashing people. People, but uh, with the way both me and Phil grapple, um, even without punches, there's a lot of smashing anyways. We're big, strong guys. We like to take people down, get on top, uh, use our weight and our power. So it, maybe, maybe it's almost like getting punched if we're laying on top of you. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm 46. I don't really, I'm not looking to fight for that much longer. But this is an opportunity and a chance to go out there against a, a very notable opponent, a champion in KSW. Mm -hmm. And you know, we'll see if I, if I put on the performance that I expect, maybe, maybe a fight could happen down the line. But either way, I think it's always good to get in the ring and, and face challenges because that's how you become that next version or that better version of yourself. It's by stepping up and, and, and going after that, which is difficult to achieve. Okay. Yeah, this uh, Saturday is going to uh, be a big fight. Glivica. I'm interested in, in being in uh, that Katowice area. It's really beautiful, yeah. I see. It's uh, Schlosk, uh, mm -hmm. as they call it. Oh, yeah, Castle. Uh, castle? Mm -hmm. Schloss. Uh, it's uh, Silesia, I think. It's Silesia. Called. Silesia, they call this part of the Poland, you mm -hmm. know. They got a special kind of a kitchen and special kind of uh, uh, of uh, local talking, you know. Hmm. Uh, oh, accent. Well, well what, it's not even the accent. It's uh, much more because of this part of the Poland was very... Uh, mixed uh, the uh, people from uh, from Poland uh, mm -hmm. with people from Germany and, Czech, so, and the uh, Czech Republic yeah. yeah so they got uh, uh, like a uh, mix of the uh, of the languages uh, made their own language uh, of course normally people just talk Polish mm -hmm. maybe with some accent but mm -hmm. there are still people you speak Silesian who, huh? yeah and uh, uh, and the Silesian it's uh, it's kind of interesting thing, you know. Hmm. Uh, I can understand this uh, when, when they do speak uh, from the context and everything, but uh, they got a lot of uh, different words. Sure. But I, th I would think being in Poland, most Polish people I've met, of course, everybody speaks Polish. They'll always speak a little bit of English at least. Uh -huh. And uh, they can speak some Russian and some German. Yes. Uh, uh, the people at my age do speak a little bit Russian, and if I would go to Russia or I would, uh, I don't know, be around the Russian people, probably I would need like three months, maybe half a year, mm -hmm. and I would be speaking. Mm -hmm. I know the book, it's the letters, uh, uh, so because I had it in a school. Mm -hmm. But there was a problem in a school because we treated this as a, a language of uh, the country who invited Poland, uh, invited. Uh, invaded Poland, invaded, yes, of invaded course. Invaded Poland, so I was like, 
I don't want to speak this language, which was stupid because it's good to know uh, any language. Uh, of course, but I think it's understandable to, 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 it's easy to understand why somebody, why a Polish person would have those opinions mm -hmm. um, or anybody in that given that situation would feel that way. You know, we move more from our emotions and from our, from the myths around us than we do from like really rational thinking in a rational sense. Yes. We should learn every language as best as we can. But uh, given a, a situation like that, I, I can see it. I can understand completely the, the Polish sentiment there. Yeah, but they also, you know, um, they learned us in a wrong way. Because if they would be a teacher who would say even something like this to us, mm -hmm. you know what? We know what's going on. You couldn't say strictly to uh, at sure. this time. You couldn't right. say just uh, what the fuck is going on. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, if you say, I may understand them, uh, that some of you don't like this language mm -hmm. from uh, certain reasons. But remember, there is always good to know something more than something less. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will learn you some very interesting things and, uh, you know, to build a, a relationship with other people. And uh, then maybe we would understand that's the first thing. And the other thing, they've been learning us r a really propaganda. They haven't been learning us uh, only a language, mm -hmm. but we had uh, all the Russian books, which we didn't care about. Mm. And uh, also this kind of stuff. And it was kind of an old language. They didn't learn us a, 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 normal things uh, so yeah that was the problem but anyway we learned something and uh, I, I don't think i would need more much to to, to learn this. yeah that's so. pretty cool i <clears throat> i envy how europeans have often the opportunity to learn so many different languages not just through schooling, but because of location, being so close to these different countries that their different languages brings the ability, or kind of the necessity to pick up these things. And uh, the more you can, you can know about the world, the more you can experience it, the more beautiful it becomes. Yes, but uh, also in states you have the multicultural country, so uh, you have so much. Uh, you know, when I was going to school, I had mostly or maybe only white people who was talking one language. Mm -hmm. That's it, you know. Uh, and uh, yeah, in states you got uh, a lot of races. A lot of people come from a lot yes. of countries. Uh, everywhere. Uh, yeah, from yeah. everywhere. Uh, there is the second big language is Spanish, I yes. think. Yeah. Yes. But I would say one of the, the issues with that is that you end up, everybody, of course, ends up speaking English at, to some point. Well, maybe not everyone in these days, but that's generally the idea. But you meet them as an American version of who they are. Mm -hmm. Meeting Polish people in America is not like meeting Polish people in Poland. And so if I ever learned anything about traveling the world is that by going to the places where these people come from, be they Polish, Mexican, uh, German, Russian, Japanese, whatever, the only way to really get to know them is to go there. To meet them in America is not the same thing. Very interesting uh, point of view. Yeah. And so uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, they change. Well, I'll say I would never want Poland to not have Polish people being Polish, mm -hmm. just as much as I would not want Japan to not have Japanese people being Japanese and mm -hmm. so on and so on, because these things make the world an interesting mosaic. It makes it mm -hmm. well, part of the reason why I started fighting was because I knew I would travel around to do this as an occupation and, you know, to bring me to places potentially like Poland, like I'm here today. And I'm really thankful for that uh, and thankful for all the ways I get to know about Polish people, what, how mm -hmm. they think, what they like, where they're from, where they're going. And, uh, <laughs> okay. you know, it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was my special guest, Essa. Ah. <laughs>